the Single Mom Success Podcast, Episode 4. Heather Wells and the Single Mom Blog present Single Mom Success, the place for single moms to find support, inspiration, and the path to their own success. Hey, everybody, and welcome to today's Single Mom Success Podcast. I hope you guys are all doing fabulous. Uh, I just wanted to start off our podcast today. Um, I'm, I'm doing sort of a series, sort of like a um, three keys or keys to success for, for single moms. And a lot of it has to do with uh, some of the changes that we need to make within ourselves uh, that are really, really critical and important to success. Um, I know that a lot of times when people think about, you know, being successful and, and uh, finding success or, or uh, being successful, <clears throat> they, uh, they often think about like, you know, the outside factors that contributed to success, you know, maybe somebody was successful because they uh, were born into a certain family or into a certain environment uh, above someone else, you know, somebody had a better environment growing up, they lived in a better neighborhood, had better schools, maybe they were, uh, you know, better prepared for success, or maybe, uh, you know, they were just predetermined to have success. And, And I kind of I understand that argument that, you know, maybe you may have had, you know, somebody who was born into that type of situation may have had uh, more opportunities available to them than to other people. But I don't I don't believe that that's the biggest contributor contributor to success. I never have. Um, It's definitely nice. It helps, I'm sure. But there are a lot of very, very successful and influential people who, you know, built themselves up from nothing. You know, they they came from horrible neighborhoods, crappy families, uh, you know, they built themselves up and brought themselves back uh, from, uh, you know, suffering from an addiction. So I don't necessarily agree that success is going to be brought about from external things. Uh, I'm not saying they don't help. I'm not saying that they're, you know, not beneficial. Uh, But also look on the flip side as well. There are people who had every single thing in the world handed to them and they ended up uh, you know, miserable, you know, there's, you know, very famous people who have, uh, gone on to, you know, they had, uh, successful lives, they were born into celebrity, and they became complete messes, like, their lives just went to, to crap, you know, because they, you know, they had every advantage in the world given to them, and they just wasted it, squandered it, you know, and ended up, you know, addicts or dead, you know, overdosing or, you know, living on the streets, you know, have no wealth anymore. So that's, it's not always necessarily the surroundings that you have that contribute to your success. I think that uh, the biggest contributor to success is going to be your mindset and your attitude and, and your thought processes. So um, the next few podcasts that I do are going to be based around that kind of structure and and thought process. So uh, one of the first things that I think is one of the biggest keys to finding success is the ability to change. And that may sound strange, but, um, you know, think about somebody that you know, because everybody knows somebody. There's always one person. You may not know them well, um, and they may be a famous person. They may be somebody in your family. They may be a friend um, who just kind of refused to change. They, their mind was set. They decided this is how they were going to be, and they were not going to change. They were not going to change. They weren't going to make any progress on themselves or their mentalities or anything like that. Um, uh, I have a, an example. My uh, my grandfather, who uh, was a very difficult man, he was uh, set in his ways. Uh, All my life growing up, I remember that I was always sort of a little bit afraid of him because he was just sort of a mean bastard for a lot of my life. um, And and he just always sort of scared me. And he was always very um, stubborn and pig-headed. And he had sort of his own mindset of, you know, women and their place and what they should do and how they should behave. Um, And he also had very set mindsets when it came to... Um, other other things. Um, I remember very distinctly that he had a difficult time accepting my stepfather. My stepfather is uh, African American, and uh, my mom and I uh, are are not. We are Caucasian, um, but oddly enough, we are are Japanese descent. My grandmother is Japanese, um, so it wasn't necessarily. I remember him having a problem <laughs> with my stepfather. 
uh, because of the fact that he was an African American. Um, so it wasn't even that he was against marrying outside of your race or dating outside of your race, clearly because he was married, in fact, to a Japanese woman. Uh, but it was because he was African American. And he was very kind of, he struggled with that for a little while, quite some time for him to really get to know my stepfather and become more comfortable with him. And, um, and, and after a while, then they, you know, found some common ground and things that they could talk about. And they, they became, you know, very pleasant, uh, with each other. And, um, so it was great to be able to see that, but for a very long time, it was, it was kind of interesting to watch him just like struggle with that mindset. Um, but it was very important for him to be able to change in order to have a a relationship with his daughter, my mom. Uh, and you know, it's not like she was not going to marry him or be with him because my grandfather disapproved. And and oddly enough, um, it's kind of a funny story when my mother, uh, informed me that she was ra- marrying my stepfather, uh, of all people, one of the people that uh, had a problem with it, not just my, my grandfather, was my grandmother, but on my dad's side. So um, if you think about this, so my parents, my mom and dad, they've been divorced since I was four years old. And the mother of my mom's ex-husband, <laughs> my dad, um, called up and, and was talking to my dad about the fact that my mother was marrying a, a black man. And my father was just astonished by this. Like, it just, it really amazed him because he, he couldn't, he, he literally, I remember the conversation. He was on the phone with her and he's like, what exactly is it that you would like me to do about this? She is my ex-wife. We have not been married for, you know, 13 years Why in the world would I have any say over who she marries? And why would I care? As long as she's happy, that's what's important to me. So why would it matter to me? And most importantly, why in the world does it matter to you? (laughs) And it was the funniest thing that I had ever come across. It was just, it was, it was amazing to me to watch just the rigidity of some people and and their inability to change. And, uh, t- you know, I think to, you know, until the day she passed, I, I still think she had an issue with it, it amazingly enough. Um, though, you know, I think she kind of eased up as she got older. But, um, you know, I, I think so many people, they just they have such a hard time uh, with that ability to change. And, um, one of my, my things when, when I talk about change, it's not even necessarily changing within yourself. Um, it's our inability to recognize that sometimes situations don't change. So kind of bringing this back to, you know, how it relates to us as, as a single mom um, or as parents or as just individuals, people in general. Um, one of my favorite quotes is, is by a, uh, a gentleman named Victor, e., uh, Victor Frankel. And he, he quoted and said, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I've always liked that because it really really sticks in my head uh, because for a very long time uh, I had a really hard time dealing with my ex, my daughter's father. Um, Really, really very difficult situation. Uh, When we initially split, uh, I was very uh, upset and emotional. You know, it was a breakup and uh, I felt like I'd had my heart broken um, because he was the first person that I had been in a relationship with for a a very long time. And he was the first person that I actually took a chance on kind of letting in. And so when we split, it was, it was very difficult for me because it it had been so long since I had sort of let myself be uh, vulnerable and open to being hurt. So when we split, you know, I was very upset, naturally. Um, Then compounded on that was that he started dating someone new, who is now currently his wife, um, like a week after we split. So it was not just, uh, I'm heartbroken, you know, the person that I chose to let into my heart, 
um, not only left and broke up with me, but I meant so little to him that a week later he was seeing somebody else. That's, I mean, that was just like absolutely devastating to me. It was horrible. And it made me feel like, it, it really, it made me feel stupid. That, that's really what it made me feel. I mean, looking back at it, it, you know, I was, you know, heartbroken and I was hurt and I was emotional and I cried and, um, you know, and I'll be the first one to admit, I went just a little bit crazy, not like crazy, bad, crazy, but just like, I mean, I was very emotional. And so, you know, I would say things that looking back, I'm like, holy crap, I was just kind of a head case for a few, you know, I, and I acknowledge that. But it was, you know, in the moment, there was nothing I could do about it, really, I was that hurt, I was that upset, because it really it you know, and then things came along later that made me realize even more how truly how little I had meant to him. Um, and finding out that you cared and, and gave so much of yourself um, emotionally to somebody who cared absolutely nothing for you is even worse to deal with. It's not just a breakup where you feel like we broke up and, you know, he's upset too. Um or, you know, maybe it affected him in some fashion, but to find out that you really just didn't mean anything to them, it's like triply devastating. <laughs> it's really, really hard to deal with. Um, so it did, it, it really sent me for a loop and it made me very, very emotionally just a nutcase really for, for a few. <laughs> I was really upset. Um, but then came down to, you know, once I finally got past that, you know, emotional hump and, and uh, was able to sort of clear my vision again and and really take a good hard look and do that whole hindsight 2020 thing um, and really take a good clear look at the person that I had been involved with and the man that I had um, chosen to, to care for um, and really stop and go, God, I have, you know, I don't, I really don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> it, um it, you know, this person clearly has way more baggage than I could ever deal with and way more baggage than I ever really want to take on. And maybe that's where a lot of our problems came from is that, you know, somewhere I acknowledged that this dude was just like, we weren't going to work because he just, he has d too many demons to deal with. And, um, but, uh, acknowledging that he and I though still had to co-parent and that was a super hard thing for me because I had never co-parented ever so I you know um if you've if you listen to any of my previous uh podcasts uh my my boys' father I have twin boys um he is not a part of their lives at all um he is not allowed to be around the children legally until they are of adult age and then it's up to them to decide if they want to meet their father um so I had been the be all end all say for my kids I, it was me. I, I was the book stopped here. It was what my way or the highway when it came to my boys. And so I had never had to figure out how to share custody. I had never had to figure out how to split my time with my child, with another parent. I had never had to figure out a visitation schedule. I, I had never had to do any of that when it came to, um, you know, and, and when our daughter was first born, you know, her dad and I, I you know, we, we butted heads a few times because I would do things like I would make appointments for her and, and not say anything to him because it just, it, it honestly didn't occur to me because it wasn't something I was used to. It, it wasn't, it was just, I did it. It was sort of automatic. It was my job and my responsibility to take care of my kids and a story. I had nobody else to help or share responsibility with, and therefore nobody else to consider before. So having to consider him and and start bringing him into the loop um, was definitely a shift for me. And, and so there was part of the change that I had to, had to deal with. Um, and so, you know, that, that took a little bit of adjusting and and then, you know, add on to it the fact that we were no longer together and I was still upset and angry and hurt. Um, there was a lot of uh, conflict when it came to uh, spending time with my daughter and 
you know, getting visitation schedules. And so, you know, I did research. I looked up online and because I didn't know. I didn't know if there was a better schedule or a worse schedule or do we just figure it out? Like what's best for the kid? Um, and she was still really little. She was uh, only a little over a year when he and I split. So it was... Uh, it was new. I had to figure it all out. And so, you know, I researched and I looked into, you know, what are the best visitation plans for a child of this age? And I looked up stuff and things psychologists said, like, I'd like dug into it because I, I didn't know. And uh, so he and I, we would butt heads a lot about a lot of things. And, um, you know, there was definitely a huge power struggle that went on between the two of us. Um, and, you know, predominantly it was, it was me having a hard time giving up that control that I had always had. And then his, you know, inflexibility or inability to understand that I wasn't doing what I was doing out of spite. It was because, you know, I was just, I was trying to do the best I could. Um, and every time there was an issue, it was almost always an argument. There was almost always spite involved. It was, it was, you know, he thought I was doing it out of spite. Um, there would be names called. And of course, then we would revert to being like 12, you know, no, I'm not, you are, you know, I mean, it was, it was really pathetically bad. Like, it, you know, to look back at it now, um, it, it, it gets really bad between he and I and, and, you know, we definitely don't have as many issues as we used to have, but I'm not going to say that we're perfect because nobody is. Um, so we still butt heads every so often, and there's still a lot of times when I get very, very angry with him and frustrated. And um, that's where my my need to change came in, um, because I have always had sort of this, I'm a daddy's girl, right? I grew up, my dad raised me from the time I was eight. I lived with my dad. Um, there were many, many years where it was just sort of him and I against the world type of thing. And I, so I had that relationship with my dad, but I've always had an awesome relationship with my dad. Like I can talk to my dad about things. He and I would always have great discussions, even when he was really upset with me. Um, you know, he'd always come back around and we'd be able to talk it out. Um, and he was just always like this this guy, like, you know, your dad's supposed to be, you know, your hero when you grow up, right? And, um, you know, and of course, I know my dad wasn't perfect. I'm, I'm sure he made mistakes. He did, you know, and he was trying to figure it out, too. I mean, here he is raising a daughter, like, he was probably like, what the hell? <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. Um, so, you know, we did the best we could. But there was never a time where I looked at my dad and was like, disappointed, with my father. Like there was never a time when I felt like I couldn't rely on my dad. And I wanted that relationship more than anything with her and her father. And I think that's where a lot of us as single moms get really stuck because we want the fathers of our children to step up and be this ideal that we have stuck in our head. Like, you know, you're supposed to want to be with your kid. You're supposed to want to spend time. Your child is supposed to be your priority because that's how we feel. Our child or children, they are our priorities, right? That's how we live. That's how we rule. That's what we do. And so to have somebody not show that same respect and reverence and priority for their children, like we don't know how to deal with that. And it makes us very angry. Like I get very angry with my ex, but for my daughter, right? Like it's, it, you know, and, and, you know, kind of, you know, maybe in the comments, ladies, tell me your thoughts on this. Um, but for me, personally, me, I would have no problem if that man dropped off the face of the planet and I never saw him ever again. I don't ever care if I ever see him. For me, personally, me. Don't care. I could go forever without ever seeing his face or hearing his name 
and be totally content in my life. That's how I feel about my boys' dad, right? I mean, I even gave him the chance to walk away. Like, I have no problem. If you want to walk, walk. I'm not going to force you to be a father, right? I shouldn't have to force you to be a father, in, in my mind. You either want to be or you don't. So, for me, I'm okay if he goes. But for my daughter, I expect a lot from him. For her, right? I expect it for her. So as moms, we get kind of pissed off, right? If the dad doesn't show up like he's supposed to, or if he's not coming through like he's supposed to, or if he's just sort of pops in and out of her life whenever he feels like it. Like, we get pissed off for our child. Not for us. We could care less whether we see the bastards, right? We don't care. But for them, we do. For them, we do. And I think that is where my biggest change had to come. I had to change my mindset when it came to her dad. So, you know, her dad has, like I said before, he's got demons, he's got issues, he's got issues with drinking, he's got a wife now who, uh, you know, is the same girl. Um, she has drinking issues. There have been domestic issues and drinking issues. Um, you know, there was a time when I had to even report them to social services to try and make sure that my daughter was safe. Um, so there's been a lot of issues around drinking with him. Um, and that's where the biggest disappointment has always been um, for my daughter. Because when he's on point and he's good and he's doing well, he's great. He shows up on time. He's communicating with me. He, you know, he and I get along great. We don't really have any arguments. Um, there's no big problems. Like, it's it's all smooth, like it should be. Co-parenting at its finest, right? Um, when the drinking comes back into play, that's where we run into issues. So when our daughter was really young, right after he and I split, um, he was sort of a no-show for a lot. I mean, he um, would make plans to come pick her up and then not show up. Wouldn't hear from him until two days later. Sorry, I totally, you know, screwed up. Yep, you did. Or, you know, can I have a makeup day? No. You know, unless you were ill, well, I wasn't feeling well. Why weren't you feeling well? Well, because I went out and you were hungover. So being hungover, you, in my mind, put drinking before your child. And then for that, no, you do not get a makeup day. You know, there are a lot of arguments that came from that. And while I do feel justified in certain areas of, you know, I don't want our daughter growing up thinking that it's okay to have this kind of lifestyle where um, you drink until you start having domestic problems and there's issues and fighting and police involved. And I don't want her to feel that that's the way things are supposed to be in, in her life. Um, I want her to feel like she wants to go over to her dad's. Like every time it's her turn to go over to her dad's for the weekend, she, uh, she gets hesitant. Like she doesn't want to go. She's afraid of what's going to happen. She's afraid of what will happen with her dad when she's not there. Um, because if they drink, she knows that there's problems. So, you know, and being so young, it's hard for me for her to know that. Um, and he and I have talked about it and there's been open discussions about it and there's an acknowledgement and an understanding that there's a problem. And if it continues to grow, obviously, um, things will have to change as far as our daughter is concerned. But, um, when this first came around, um, I had that in my head of this is the way a father should be. A father should be like mine. A father should be on point. A father should, you know, this is how he should behave. And the fact that he's not behaving the way that I think he should behave is it's wrong. He's wrong. And I'm angry for that. Um, and that's where my change had to happen for me. Because here's the thing. No matter how much we yell or scream, or explain, or discuss, or barter, or beg, they are not going to be any different than who they are, not for us. And if they are not willing to change for their child, 
Nothing that we say is going to make that happen. Nothing that we say is, you know, it doesn't matter how angry we get at them. It's not going to happen. We can't change them. So going back to that quote, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves, right? That means that we have to change the way we perceive the situation, the way that we deal with the situation. Now, when it comes to like issues with my ex and the drinking, you know, like I said, there was a time when I had to report them to social services. Didn't want to do it. Didn't feel like that was something that I ever thought I would ever have to do. But it was something that had to happen, right, to ensure the safety of my child. So if there's something going on that's causing, obviously, issues for your child, safety concerns for your child, of course, things have to happen. However, yelling at your ex, telling him you have to quit drinking is not going to change. You know, it's not going to make him quit drinking. Yelling at your ex saying you have to show up and be here for your child is not going to make him show up and be there for his child. So instead of being angry at him because he's not the father I want him to be for our daughter, I accept who he is. It doesn't mean I have to like it, right? I accept who he is. And as long as my child is safe and secure and not in any danger, then that acceptance brings me more peace. And honestly, it really honestly does. And I know that it may not make sense because, you know, you know, and there's probably a lot of you who are like, that's ridiculous. You should be pissed off if he's not showing up for his kid. Don't get me wrong. I'm still unhappy for her, right? I'm upset for her, but I'm not going to let his stupidity or his inability to to be the person that I think he should be. I'm not going to let that make me miserable. Like that's just giving him a ton of power over me because I can rant and rave and be pissed forever and he could give a crap. Like he doesn't care if he made me angry. He doesn't care if he upset me. I mean, in all honesty, ladies, let's talk about this. Do you care if you piss them off? Do you care if you make them angry? Do you care if you say something that hurts their feelers? No, you don't care, right? So they don't care. Why would they care if you're upset with them? They're not going to. You're not their girlfriend or wife anymore, right? They don't have to necessarily make amends with you, except when it comes to their child. And here's the thing, holding on to that anger and that unhappiness about them not being who you think they should be for your child is only like eating you up, right? It's making you unhappy. It's making you miserable. And instead of doing that, then, you know, just flip it and and say, okay, if you're not going to be the dad that I want you to be, you're going to be the dad that you can be, right? So if it's his weekend and he doesn't show up, I have about two minutes where I'm just like, that bastard, right? Because I'm upset for her. And then I let it go. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go about my weekend. We're going to do the stuff we were going to do. I give my daughter extra love and hugs and make sure that she knows that she is loved and that I'm here for her because that's all I can do, right? And we go about our day. And she knows, you know, hey, if I hear from your dad, I'll let you know. Hopefully we hear from him. And in doing this, I'm I'm making my daughter feel, at least I hope, I hope, I mean, I think that's how it always is in life, right? When you have kids, you just do the best you can and hope to God you don't totally scar them for life, right? You're just sort of flying by the seat of your pants, praying to God you don't traumatize them. Um, my hope is that when I do this, I... I make her feel secure. I I kind of, I I don't make it a big deal because if she sees me make it a big deal, then it makes it worse for her, right? Like she gets more upset because he didn't show up. Instead, if I just make it and say, okay, well, I don't know what happened, but we're going to go and do this or we're going to go and do that. Let's go about our day. We're not going to make it 
uh, upset us. We're not going to eat it alive. Are you okay? You know, I talked to her. Do you, are you okay? Do you want to talk about it? Nope. Let's just go do what we're going to do. And unfortunately, here's the thing. I mean, you're doing the best that you can. I feel that I'm there and I'm comforting and supporting my daughter and making sure that she feels loved. Um, but then when you look at it the other way, I'm not making her feel bad about her dad. Her dad is making her feel bad about her dad. So basically, I'm sort of stepping back and letting him develop the relationship he's going to develop with his daughter. And unfortunately, right now, the relationship that she has with him is that she loves him, of course, because he's her dad, but also one where she feels she can't rely on him. That's the, that's the mentality that he has built for her. Um, and I'm not going to encourage that mentality. I'm not going to support that mentality. I'm not going to sit there and say, well, your daddy's unreliable. We can't rely on him. Um, but she knows that. And, you know, the hope is always there. And I always make sure to make it a point and say, well, you know, um, maybe things will get better. Maybe he'll, you know, finally get to a point where we won't have to worry about this. And so she hopes for better. But I'm trying to teach her kind of that same mentality. We can't change a situation. The only thing that we can do then is change ourselves and how we react to that situation and how we deal with that situation. So instead of allowing that disappointment or anger or whatever to totally dictate the rest of our day or our week or a month or our life, you know, you sit there and you start and thinking, and, and I think, like I said, that's that's why we get so upset is we are determined in our mind. We're like, ah, I want you to change. If I had a magic wand, I would wave it over your head and change you into this parent that I think you should be, right? That's That's how we feel a lot of times, right? They don't live up to our expectations of what they should be doing. Well, you know what? No matter how much you rage against that, it's not going to change. It's not going to make a difference. So why let that person make you unhappy? If they are choosing that path for themselves with their children, there's nothing that you can say or do that's going to make a difference. Now, it is up to you to decide, you know, if you've got somebody who bails and they've never been in their lives and then one day they decide to show up and be a parent, you know, I, I think... I think that would probably be very hard. I know that I would be very angry and very resentful, but I would also think of my child and say, okay, you weren't here, but now you're here. Um, you know, are you safe for my child to be around? If the answer is yes, then yeah, you know, I would let them be a part of my child's life if, if that's what they wanted to. Um, only because it's for them. It's not for us. You know, and I see a lot of moms are like, oh, he just wants to pop in and out whenever it's fine for him and blah, blah, blah. Right? Okay. I understand that makes life very difficult for you because you can't plan your life around somebody not being predictable. Right? So, you know, if you want to be back in our lives, fine. This is the schedule that I'm willing to work with. And if you meet the schedule, you know, if you come on Thursdays after school, you can spend a few hours with them. That's your day. If you miss it, then you miss it. You have to wait till next week, right? This is the schedule because, you know, we have lives and we have things that are going on and this is what we need to do. And if it is important for you to be with your child, then you will make this happen. If you can't make it happen, then let's talk about something else that you can do. Um, one of the things that, you know, we've always been able to do, it, it hasn't always been pretty, but we've always tried is to work out the time to be able to see our daughter, you know, that visitation schedule. And it did take a long time to get onto a level playing, you know, level ground where we were, you know, both okay with it. But there's always been that, hey, I want to talk to you about having more time with, with my daughter. Okay, let's discuss it. I may not agree with everything that you have to say, but let's see if we can con find some common ground. It's, you know, and in my mind, in the back of my mind, there's always this voice that says, well, we have a really hard time getting you to keep the time that you have. Why would you want to increase your time with her? Right? Because in my mind, it's like, dude, I can't even get you to show up for the days that you do have. Why would you want to increase the time? I'm still willing to talk. I'm still willing to discuss it. 
And, you know, we've changed the schedule a couple of times where he would get more time with her and it worked for a few weeks and then it fell back off to every other weekend again. And I just let it go. You know, I'm not going to track you down or chase you down to try and get you to spend time with your daughter. Your time with your daughter is yours. How you choose to spend it is yours. If you choose to take the time, fine. If not, that's your call. I'm not going to get angry anymore because as far as I'm concerned, that's more time for me to spend with my daughter. It works out well for me. So being able to change your mindset, that change, that sort of shift, um, is definitely something that was really critical in the success in my relationship with her dad. And again, it's not perfect. I, He and I still have disagreements about things. We still have issues. Nothing like it was before. Nothing like it was when we first started out. And remember, I mean, that's the thing. Everybody wants to have this ideal relationship with the, the parent, the other parent of their child, right? That's the ideal. You want to be able to get to that. Well, in order to get to that, there has to be change. Because if right now things are horrible and miserable and you're unhappy and they're unhappy and you guys are always arguing or fighting or whatever, if that's what's going on, then obviously something has to change. And if the fool you were married to or the boy, the man you were with is not going to be the one to change, then there needs to be some change in you. And it may not be, and I'm not saying, okay, I'm just going to agree to whatever he says. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying just kowtow to the dude. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is the change may not be external. It may not be, okay, I'll give you everything you want. The change may be the way that you mentally deal with the issues at hand, the way that you emotionally deal with the issues at hand, right? And it may need to be a change that something as simple as you and I clearly cannot get along. I'm tired of banging my head up against a wall. So we're just going to go to court and we're going to figure it out. We're going to let them decide. And then we have nothing to argue about anymore. If that's what needs to happen, then that's what needs to happen. And that's actually what needed to happen with my ex and I. You know, for a really, really long time, we butted heads. We were very stubborn. We were both very unhappy. And there was this constant, you know, I was constantly being threatened. I'll file papers on you. I'll take you to court. Heather, I'll take you to court. You know, and I was like, fine, take me to court. And it never, ever, ever happened. Um, you know, child support was being used as a leveraging tool. If you don't do this, I'm not going to give you child support. If you're not willing to do this, then I'm not going to pay you. Okay, I'm done. So finally, after a while, I just said, look, this is getting us nowhere. So I'm just going to file the paper. So I went and I filed. And of course, he was unhappy. He's like, I can't believe you filed. Well, <laughs> of course I did. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of doing this. I'm tired of both of us trying to use different things to leverage each other. I'm tired of either both of us trying to manipulate a situation. And, and I know that we're both guilty of it, right? So let's just go to the courts. The courts will get it. It's in paper. It's in writing. This is the way it's going to be. And we're done. And that was how it was for a while. And then as we moved on and as we both sort of chilled out a little bit and realized kind of the way we were behaving it was easier for us to say, okay, can we adjust the schedule? Or, hey, this is what I'm having a problem with. And I still talk to him and say, hey, look, you know, you didn't show up. I know you didn't show up because you went out the night before. So you were drunk or hungover or whatever, right? Please don't do this to our daughter again, right? I'm not going to just sit back and not say something if I'm concerned, if it's affecting her. I mean, that's my job as her parent, but I don't let it get me angry. I don't let it eat away at me like it used to, right? I acknowledge there's an issue. I state the problem that I have. I talk to him or I try to, um, and then I let it go. And, you know, if I notice it becomes a continual pattern, if it becomes something where I'm worried about her safety or I'm concerned with how it's affecting her, then there might need to be other steps that are taken, right? That's always a possibility. But it's not something where I'm heartbroken over it anymore. I'm not angry all the time. I'm not letting it sit there and eat away at me. It just is something that I was able to change within myself to say, this is not how I'm going to live my life. I'm not going to 
completely rail on him because he's not the father that I want him to be. I accept him for the father that he is. I may not always like the facets of it, but I know that as long as my daughter is safe and healthy and happy, there's, I'm only going to make myself miserable trying to make him something that he's not. Right? So there's that change. The change that we need to make within ourselves sometimes when that external situation is not something that we can change. Right? So I hope that this was really helpful to you. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, I would love to hear any feedback or comments that you have, any times that you've had to come across this, different ways that you were able to sort of change within yourself in order to improve your situation and find some forms of success for yourself and for your children. Um, Please feel free and leave comments. I love hearing them. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear those as well. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. If you haven't already subscribed to our podcast, I would love for you to do that. Um, I try and come out with them every week, uh, usually on Mondays. Um, You know, life of a single mom is not always predictable, so sometimes they don't come out on Mondays, but I try and get them out every week. I hope that you've really enjoyed this, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. You've been listening to the Single Mom Podcast, the place to go for support, encouragement, and maybe a few laughs along the way. Please also make sure you head on over to the Single Mom blog for more great stuff for single moms. We have resources, free things to print out, great articles. Can't wait to see you there. Be sure to leave feedback and comments because we love hearing from other single moms. And if you like this podcast, please be sure to subscribe.